good evening to all of you in uh, india and a good day to all of you in the rest of the world um, my name is anand i am a core member of the thai iot forum and it's my pleasure to introduce my good friend and ex colleague dilbag gill uh, who is the ceo and team principal of mahindra racing uh, we thought of the unique way of introducing uh, iot matrix and you will see why we chose this as the opening keynote address because it brings in one place everything that joy spoke to you about in real time in action so let me introduce briefly dilbag gill he was appointed uh, as the ceo and principal of mahindra racing ahead of their first racing season this is the e racing formula e with electric cars okay mahindra racing is one of the 10 founding members of electric racing in the world and uh, this is in uh, it started in 2014 15 dilbag has built his team scratch from scratch uh, and uh, today it's a formidable force in the racing world dilbag has over two decades of unique experience in the combination of technology and sports you know he he plays at the at the intersection of both these and he has chosen this as a career um, just to illustrate before taking up this role at mahindra racing he was a project manager of the fifa world cup program fifa as you know is the foremost uh, uh, football uh, event which happens every four years and uh, dilbag was the project manager for the fifa world cup and he developed he not only managed the sponsorship but he also developed a high power industrial grade website uh, apart from other software and this used to take a million hits per second so that's the kind of uh, so he's both familiar with software technology as well as sports okay uh, he is a mechanical engineer with a passion for sports and uh, technology uh, i won't take too much because we do have time uh, uh, in this session during this one hour what we will be doing is this will go in three parts first is dilbag will make his presentation second part i will do a chat with him on a few the things relating the racing sports to the real world of business that we are in and to the electric vehicle industry in particular and third part will be we will have an audience q and a so without any ado we are all looking forward to an exciting opening keynote from dilbag over to you thank you anand thank you joy thank you uh, ravi for this lovely introduction uh, i'm really happy to be here first of all when you talk about the iot matrix you've talked about connected ambient and intelligent well i think it is a connected world because i'm uh, speaking this morning from boston Uh, it's 6:30, and we talk about ambient, and I'm going off the uh, point out here because it's minus one degree centigrade outside. And the last part was intelligent, and I can assure you one thing: I am not intelligent. So, and that sets the context. And I think going forward, it's really exciting because I'm going to be setting the bar quite low uh, on this, and I'm really looking forward to the next maybe hour where I can talk to you a little bit about what I do and what gives me a lot of joy. So, if I, I think I need to get some. Uh, Yeah, to start the screen share. Uh, Dilbag, you have screen share, uh, right? Yes. Yeah. And I'll just yeah, I'll just start that. Yeah, and if, if you can tell me once. If you and you will see two check boxes under your screen share. If you can check that as well. I've done that. I hope you. Okay. Uh, if you could give me a thumbs up, uh, Tulika, that if you the screen is on online. Yeah, it's online. Okay. So again, uh, thank you everyone for joining in. the topic i'm going to talk about today is give me one second i'm actually asking you for one second over the next one hour and in that's quite interesting because for us in the world we live in one second is immense okay so what's the meaning of this one second when we go racing we are 24 cars on the track there are 12 different teams okay each team has two cars and typically when we go for a qualifying lap the difference between the fastest car and the slowest car over a lap of maybe 2 to 3 kilometers is less than 1 second so what we are all fighting for is 1 tenth 100th and 1000th of a second we are measured to 1000th of a second 
So what I'm going to be asking out here through this whole thing is looking at all of you, if you can come up with thoughts and ideas to help us go one second faster. Mahindra Racing is in Formula E, which is the world's fastest growing sport. And it is the only sport which is net zero from a carbon side. So we talk about sustainability, we talk about relevance. And that's where we're going to be going to be spending a lot of time this, this evening. So when we talk about Formula E, and I'll give you a bit of an introduction, I want to just set up a stage where we are reached where the hardware we have in our racing cars is reaching peak. We're talking about engines which are around 97 to 98% efficient. If you look at the best petrol cars, the best gasoline cars, which is the Mercedes Formula One engine, it's really around 48% efficient. So we've already doubled that efficiency. So we have reached a stage where we are reaching diminishing return, but most of the returns we're getting now is through software. And that's something that you're gonna be talking about today. Among the teams we race with in Formula E and we being one of the founding teams, we are one of the smaller teams. We are racing against Audi, BMW, Porsche, Mercedes, et cetera. So that's why we have the equation on the top right of the screen where we say our ambition is far ahead or far greater than our resource. So we are entrepreneurs. We are, being, we are punching above our weight out here. And what we're trying to do out here is to bring success, bring joy back to our country. End of the day, why are we in Formula E? It's what we call the race to road program. We are transferring technology very quickly from the racetrack to the road. And all of you know, with a bit of tongue in cheek, Mahindra acquired Reva many years ago. And forgive me for saying that, but Reva was one of the world's slowest electric cars. And in a short period of four years, we have gone from making the world's slowest electric car to making Batista in Italy now, which is the world's fastest electric car. It's an hypercar of 1,900 horsepower. Trust me, it's something which is great fun to drive. And I hope at some point in time, we can bring it for a show to India. So that's this context on Formula E. I'm going to just give you a little bit more in terms of what this championship is all about. As I said, it's the fastest growing sport in the world with around 1.5 billion viewers. We are the only net carbon zero footprint in the world. And I think the per because we are a purpose-driven championship and our purpose is to accelerate EV adoption around the world. And I think that's something which is really exciting, very relevant, and at the same time, which is very applicable. I'm quite confident when I say this, that the second or the third car you might acquire from today would be an electric vehicle. Hold me on that. So in this whole championship called Formula E, who is Mahindra? We are India's leading motorsport team, the oldest manufacturer in this championship. So we put our bets very early into this championship and we were very right about it. Okay, we are the greenest team in motorsport and that gives me immense amount of pride. Okay, we are the greenest team. We have received the highest level of sustainability accreditation for our team. We are actually carbon positive because of the credits which we're sort of working out there. And we do a lot of work, exciting work with our fan base, which is again, the largest fan base in our sport of more than 2 million followers. And if I'm not mistaken, maybe, or arguably, we are the only Indian team in a world championship. So from our perspective, we carry our country and India uh, pretty much strongly, and you will see some images of the car, et cetera. And the middle of the back of the car does carry a flag because we say the backbone of our, of our team is India. Without further ado, I'm basically just going to show you a movie of around two minutes. I have to give you a disclaimer. My lawyers have advised me to give you a disclaimer. Please don't try this at home. So next thing is a, is a movie. I hope you enjoy this to give you a bit of a context what formula is all about. And then we'll go to the IoT part of it. The lights are coming on and for the first time, we go green in Beijing. When we got into Formula E in 2013, we did not know what we were getting into. The fact that Mahindra was the first OEM to join was massively important at the time. It's a strong statement to our partners that we are here for the long run. Oh, and it's all kicking off here. Senna holds on. They convinced me that they know what to do. This is why I moved. It's third for Nick Heidfeld and Mahindra. It is a monumental day for Felix Rosenquist. We did it then! Yeah! That was a very, very proud moment for us because that told us what all we've been doing for the first few years was right. That was a really great moment for us. And from there on, we had many podiums. Durand 
Pascal, you are a star, man. That was a wonderful job. I mean, got the highest level of accreditation from the FIA from sustainability. No one else had started the journey yet. They've been a great team, very competitive. They've won many races. They have been a loyal partner all these years. And here they are going forward to Generation 3. Mahindra Racing is continuing its journey because we believe in what we're doing out here. We're not building something for today. We're building something for tomorrow. Well, I hope that gives you a little bit of context. It's pretty uh, bizarre speaking to a computer screen this morning and not seeing any reactions of people around the world. So I just hope it's a bit of interesting stuff. So let me talk a little bit about what this whole topic's about, which is IoT. Okay, so I believe we are not a racing team, but we are a product company on steroids because we are talking about technology and we're talking about accelerating the development of technology on the racing field to bring it to a, ra to a road car near you or something that you're going to buy. So we have more than 120 sensors on our car. And as I'm just reading some stats off the screen, we're talking about 10 Mbps transfer rate, 30 GB of data. End of, the, end of an hour's race, we have basically around you know, 40 hours of movie sort of content coming out of there. And this is something which you have to process instantaneously. Okay, this is something which we are trying to do at the spot. And I'll sort of take you through certain examples because what we are getting out of this data is going to give us performance in the track and we exist on the racetrack to win. Okay, remember like the old adage in sport is, second is always the first of the losers. And I think we take that pretty seriously because we are there to win uh, first and foremost. And there we are there to sort of work with the champions, work with uh, against the other teams, et cetera. So the way we are sort of structured is we have two drivers in the race car. So we have two cars out on the track. We have around 12 race engineers who are sitting at track side, looking at the data and like working with the drivers. And we have around maybe 20 to 30 engineers working back in a base in England, supporting it. So the information is sort of sent out in the car, at track side and remote. And how do we work with all of this is something which we'll be talking about going forward. So first thing is we use a lot of artificial or augmented reality and virtual reality before an event. We, we have these big simulators in a track where a driver actually spends between the two drivers nearly 400 hours practicing before we go to a race. A race is of around one hour's length. So we do a ratio of around 400 is to one practicing for it. Why do we practice so much? First and foremost is we want the driver to build the muscle memory. So when he goes to track, he knows exactly what he's doing. And when you talk about these tracks, we have scanned these rail, uh, tracks with a laser to around one mm. So we know every imperfection on the track, et cetera. And then we sort of build it out and we sent a simulator out there. So while the driver builds up muscle memory, we also start practicing our strategy in terms of, okay, where do we overtake? What do we need to do? What happens in this scenario? We do all our various scenario analysis, et cetera. So that before we go to the racetrack, we are totally prepared. And from our perspective, when we talk about augmented reality and virtual reality, we have something called ghost racing also. So there are so many gamers around the world. There are so many enthusiastic, enthusiastic racers where we sort of invite them to race our drivers. While our driver's in the simulator, we have other people joining him. So we actually create sort of virtual races which you see in the top right-hand corner out here. So there are people pretending to be the BMW car or the Jaguar car, et cetera. And we go, so we do a lot of this work in terms of uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. But And again, we talk about the driver uh, when he's driving, he makes mental marks. Okay, this is where I'm going to be braking. This is where I'm going to be accelerating. And as the race goes on, the, the track evolves. When you say the track evolves, it means there's more rubber coming on, the grip is improving, so he can brake later and later as he goes. And so he keeps all these various marker points. It could be a stop sign on the side of the track. It could be a sticker very max. So when you look at it, all of this has to be recorded in for him to sort of come in and take it going forward. So while we do this, this is all preparation, I said, before the race. We have not yet reached the racetrack at this point of time. We're just doing this. So now when you get to the racetrack, we would do a lot of work around AI and ML. And I'm using some of the abbreviations, which I think all of us are familiar with. And some examples out here are we do very strong voice analysis. So we are listening to our two drivers who are talking to us constantly, but not only to us, but we're listening to the other 22 drivers also. 
and we have certain tools and technologies which i will not go into too much depth right now because it is a bit of a competitive and uh, sort of advantage what we have we are listening to stress in the voice we're listening to keywords so that gives us a little bit of an area in terms of okay what's happening with the competition how do we react is someone going to have a problem is uh, no what's the thing and normally the stress okay it's in different languages different cultures stress is explained differently so we have to look at that also then we do a lot of video capture because uh, there is television broadcasting it there are people uh, sitting around uh, taking video films etc and the middle image you see is like a television image so this is one of our competitors cars we see okay uh, at that point of time what's he doing right now he's under braking so he's actually regening uh, an energy like 220 kilowatts back into things so we look at where he's doing it uh, what was his like his uh, his throttle position at 143 kph or whatever it is and you know, what is the sector timing so all this data is coming on the tv screen we again take this video capture in and put it into a database and sort of gives us an idea is someone braking later than us is someone getting on the accelerator earlier than us uh, you know what's the line they're taking through the corner etc so that helps us a lot the third bit which i should not understate and i can't understate is what we have biometry so we have certain chips in the driver's gloves and that gives us the functions of the of of a driver okay so we know in terms of like how the body of the driver is working at the point of time in terms of his stress levels etc but more and more important is in the eventuality of an accident we have the information in terms of okay, how hard the impact was how many g's so that also helps the doctors even before they can reach uh, or the driver in terms of some information and i think if any of you are formula 1 fans a couple of weeks ago a good friend of mine roman grosjean had a pretty bad accident in bahrain it was i think 54g but before the doctors even reached there which they reached within a minute they had a lot of data from the driver back to back to themselves and uh, so the hospitals whatever is needed uh, immediate uh, care can start getting taken care of and the last part of i think this bit if i just sort of keep this expansion going on out here is we're talking about competitor analysis we are like literally in a chess game a virtual chess game of 24 games going on at the same time and motorsport is unique because motorsport is the only sport in the world where two teammates are competing against each other so in our own garage we have to provide strategy for driver a versus driver b and give them both the best opportunity to be successful so while we want them to be teammates we also have to give them individual tools to go be successful in the end of the day motorsport is where one driver wants to beat his teammate because and like when we talk about teammates etc again i'm going to give you the formula 1 example in mercedes you, you say like hamilton wants to beat uh, valtteri bottas because you can say the car is only equal then when when we have an equal car i'm better than him and i think that's something which is really important when we do our analysis on soft talent etc that an equal product because otherwise there's variations within the cars etc so we're doing all of this with those 12 engineers on site we're doing voice analysis we're doing video capture analyzing video taking decisions feeding it back to the driver looking at his uh, biometry in terms of what information is coming in and competitive analysis so there's a lot of work actually which is going on in this 45 minutes or 50 or 1 hour of the race while it looks pretty intense we're also sort of masterminding how to sort of take this all going on so having said that uh, the next bit which i'd like to talk to you a little bit about in iot is edge computing so i'm just going to go to the next yeah so we have the edge computing so what we talked earlier when i start, uh, started this conversation is give me one second so here we are all discussing stuff in milliseconds okay so between the first car which is in this picture to our car which is a third car or there's a lovely bright red car is okay there's like 0.11 second 7 seconds so that's like 1 10th of a second difference and to the sixth car it's another 3 tenths of a second behind us so and those are two cars at this point in time we are trying to track with, with our strategy because we know okay we might be able to cover the car in between we are looking at the attack mode which you're trying to take we are in a second attack mode at this point of time and uh, this the sixth car which is like 3.3 second just not taken in attack mode yet so we know okay we might come under stress with them so we are actually doing multiple simulations at the track in terms of okay what's the performance of our competitors at that point of time okay so we are getting data and data comes in again through timing screens we have very accurate gps data so we not only know uh, where the car is on track it also tells us where he is or the driver is and the width of the track is in the inside of the line or the outside etc so for example if i'm looking back at this picture 
car three is on the outside, car six is on the inside. So we sort of say, okay, six is trying to make an overtake, the line is starting to evolve out there, et cetera. So all this is happening, what I say, uh, uh, like edge computing. So we, while we do depend on the cloud, at the race weekend, we're doing a lot more work uh, closer to the site or at the edge itself. So having said that. So as I said, like our simulations are not one, to the second, but it's to one hundredths to one thousandths of a second. And that's why it's really important because for us, the whole uh, mantra of our, uh, of our game is energy management. We have to manage our energy, which is DC energy in a battery optimally so that we finish the race with literally zero energy. We run out of energy maybe within 100 meters of crossing the finish line. But there's no point of having more than that. We have wasted it. If we, if we have more than one, maybe 0.05 kilowatts of energy, that could have been used during the race. So we are going to be pretty upset that we've not used all the energy. At the same time, we do not want to finish the energy before the thing and not finish the race. And it just goes back to one of my saddest moments in Formula E, which is Mexico last year. We were leading the race and our car literally ran out of energy 100 yards of, uh, from the finish line. So uh, we sort of just coasted the finish line and we lost a position from first to second. And so that's uh, the story of the, the game, why we continue doing simulations and working on edge computing at the track side. So we talked a little bit about AI ML, we talked about AR, VR, we talked about edge computing. The next bit for us in our nomenclature is of computer vision is we have a tool called driver's eye. So there's a camera which is less than maybe just I'll say like an inch away from the driver, the driver's actual eye. So if you look at the side of the helmets, there are two little cameras on the other thing. And that sort of gives us a picture of what our driver is literally seeing. So we in close to real time, do get what a driver seeing because see remember we've done so much simulation we can make everything a constant in racing we can make the car a constant we can make our energy management the constant unfortunately the only variable we have is a driver he's a human being so we have to we try through simulation to make the driver a constant also so that it becomes more predictable but human beings are human beings the, the visor comes down uh, emotion gets charged in people are, are, are sort of pushing out there to be successful on track so what we do with driver's eye is we look at not only our drivers, we look at some of the competitor drivers who are using driver's eye and then we sort of feed this information back to our thing. Okay, saying that, okay, you're losing a little bit of time maybe on turn two because you're taking the corner slightly too aggressively or too, uh, the, your line is not the best. This is where you can sort of improve. So we are sort of doing improvements during the race also in terms of uh, not through computer vision, what, what we see from our purpose and from folks, what we see out there. So what we're trying to do in month, which I will be talking towards the end of this is when I'm asking for help, and maybe this is an area where we would like to get a bit more help from some of you who are sitting in this audience. So while we do all of this in racing, which is quite exciting, we also have to look at a bigger purpose than all of this. So when the pandemic started this year in around uh, March, April, <clears throat> a large part of our team is actually Spain-based. And we had the team in Spain, and as you know, Italy and Spain are the sort of the first two countries which had this huge peak in uh, the virus attack out there, and it sort of overwhelmed the local hospitals, it overwhelmed the local infrastructure, etc. So we looked at it and said, how can we help? So we used actually a strategy software, which we use at the racetrack. We repurposed it, and it was literally prototyped within hours. I'm not joking. It was like within three hours, we were able to reprototype it. And we had it deployed within 48 hours in a hospital. And typically what happens out here is one, uh, one computer could manage 255 ventilators then in that particular hospital. And we were able to get this and sort of set out. The first batch of sort of 100 computers were sent out to various hospitals around Barcelona. Then we uh, took it to uh, the other regions within Catalonia, et cetera. And then thereafter to some South American countries. So we were able to get telemetry of of like as we, we call it telemetry of the patients, uh, various alarms, et cetera. And this all follows the inherent Mahindra philosophy of rise for good. So it was really satisfying that during the pandemic, we were able to help. And over and above this, we were also able to use certain other tools, what we had in terms of 3D printing, rapid prototyping, et cetera, to make masks, make other bits. But that doesn't have the context of IoT. What we're trying to say out here is that the software which we had developed for looking at the health of a racing car was able to be repurposed to look at the health of a patient at a hospital out there. And I think that gave us immense amount of pride that we were able to do something quickly and we were able to do stuff. 
Uh, our software is called Playground because uh, we try a lot of little bits out here. And this little bit of what we call Playground is being today adapted to become, again, we have engineers giving names and not marketing people. So uh, I think we are trying to look at a crystal ball basically to build up a database of our cars across the various races and our competitors in terms of, so that helps us with better predictive and uh, better decision-making support during a race. So that's essentially what we're talking about in this whole uh, paradigm of IoT. So again, to uh, give a mini wrap up, we have AR, VR, AI, ML, edge computing, computer vision. So now that's the purpose of motorsport out here. So while a lot of you might've been wondering, what is a racing team doing at an IoT matrix? I think this is why we're here and this is why we're really excited because I'm looking forward to all of you suggesting uh, thoughts or giving us help to go back. So the, the topic today was, give me one second. So I am asking you for one second. I'm asking all of you, if you have any thoughts or processes to help us improve that, what I call the golden, the holy grail of one second. So we are looking for technology partnerships. We are a young team based out of United Kingdom near Oxford. We have certain, uh, strong partners in the technology side like ZF, Shell, et cetera. But where I think we are sort of weak is on the software side comparatively. And some of the cutting edge stuff around maybe ML, um, a bit of computer vision, edge computing, et cetera. So at the end of the day, looking for like-minded people like us for innovation at what we call at racing speeds. For us, like literally and my uh, entire background has been in sport. I'm not much of a technical guy though I've worked in, in the technology industry we have to be confident when we take stuff on the sport that we don't have the typical software development life cycle of staging, development, et cetera. We have to work on production. Sometimes we have to get uh, really uh, to push uh, bits of this. So we, we have to do it right the first time around. And end of the day, we believe we are inherently an India team and would love to see like-minded challenges coming from our uh, portfolio and especially from the, around the Bangalore area where I went to college and it gives me a lot of good memories. I'd love to see support coming in from, from India. And you know, it's something which is going to give us a lot of energy to go forward. And energy is the name of the game in motorsport. So that's a little bit uh, thing. So with this, I'm sort of just going to uh, come towards the end of my session where I'm going to finish the presentation. So we always talk about change. We talk about challenges. We know life is a race with no finish line but that doesn't mean we cannot go faster my email is dilbag.gil at mahindrafe.com that's mahindrafe for formula e.com dilbag.gil and if you look at the picture of the car you'll see the orange white and green of india at the backbone of a car and that's something which keeps us going so with this and without further ado thanks very much for joining me on this session it was really good fun and now i'll uh, look forward to if there's any questions to so I'll take it there and I'm going to be stopping the share of my screen. Thank, thank you, Gil, Dilbag. Uh, Tulika, just a quick check. Uh, uh, this is Anand here. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Great. Well, I guess uh, uh, that was all of connected, ambient and highly intelligent uh, aspects of racing. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our audience uh, would have got into the complexities and insights which and the detailed work and preparation that goes in before the race and obviously during the race of 45 minutes which you took us through literally through the individual technology hot buttons uh, and uh, post race too uh, there's a fair amount of stuff that goes on uh, uh, post race I'm sure between two, um, two races, which I think during the season is once every two weeks or once every four weeks, uh, you have a lot of time to uh, analyze the past and prepare for the future next race in terms of the circuit, uh, its uh, complexities, in terms of maybe competition and so on. So uh, the next uh, part of this, uh, Delbag, obviously we have, you've just given us a taste of what the, uh, what the competitive racing world is like. And this is racing with a purpose because you're, you're uh, carbon positive, not just carbon neutral. Uh, you're highly connected to the future green world and uh, that is uh, electric vehicles. 
and uh, therefore it, it it is uh, absolutely relevant uh, for everyone here and we are really going to talk a little bit about technology and so on so let me now ask a few questions in a chat mode with you and uh, we will so to the audience i'm going to ask a few questions on aspects which uh, dilbag has not covered and we have kept it uh, specifically in a chat for for discussion right now after that we will open up the floor to questions and i will keep seeing in the chat box and i'll request our zoom operator uh, tolika to keep posting uh, uh, the questions onto the chat box which will take up in about uh, five to uh, about 10 minutes from now okay and uh, therefore keep the questions coming uh, as we go forward now so let me just ask a few more questions which are more connected uh, intimately with us uh, here in india and uh, you mentioned dilba right in the beginning that uh, mahindra acquired reva which of course is a is a proud bangalore company you know in that sense and reva ma made some of the first uh, earliest four wheelers here but you did acquire mahindra reva and uh, the, um, uh, the and and then built and and then using that as a part of the uh, entry strategy if you will or part of the portfolio of cars for the commercial uh, world you know so if you have some and i know you do visit uh, 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 the the company or an advisory board uh, member there so what kind of inputs do you take from the racing world and give them as inputs into the product development of the electric vehicles of mahindra that's my first question uh thank you anand i think that's a really interesting question because see the purpose of our existence is what we call is race to road so how do we transfer technology from the race track to the road and i think what we initially try and do is accelerate the rate of development see typically in if you look at the industry of automotive industry it takes on 6 years for a new model to be de developed we do a new car every year so we are basically like doing six cycles of development before a typical automotive thing comes in so when we look at like for example battery technology we looking at some of the latest in battery technology and that sort of gets transferred back quicker to to mahindra reva or automobili penan freena or uh, pojo etc we mahindra has a lot of electric investments around the world so we sort of working on them in terms of either battery technology the other area which we are working on is what we call composites so we're taking technology of like moving from steel and aluminium to lighter weight plastics composites etc which bring a lot more efficiency last but not the least is efficiency so we are developing programs to help drivers drive these cars better and it's funny enough okay if you look at the mahindra portfolio of electric mobility the largest selling product we have today is auto rickshaws so if you can teach an auto rickshaw driver to drive maybe 10 to 15 kilometers longer on a battery charge he earns more money so it's a direct return in terms of it so there are like sort of ways which we are developing algorithms etc to help a driver so when you look at driving when we started uh, we typically started with a car with three pedals in it the accelerator the brake and the clutch the abc as we call it as technology improved and many people have started driving automatic cars when they have two pedals the accelerator and the brake and now as you go to electric it's largely all the controls on the accelerator because when you lift off braking is already starting and regenerative thing so you only touch the brake at the last moment before thing so it's a whole mind shift in terms of how you drive from three pedals two feet to one foot just lifting off and on and doing it gently so those are little sort of uh, examples and at the same time we're also looking at coming out of certain innovations in terms of telematics how do we know the health of the car remotely so uh, from an electric mobility these cars are connected cars so we can literally tell you when does it need service how what service does it need and since there are less moving parts in an electric car your service is more infrequent compared to a petrol car yeah good i think uh, this uh, uh, abc analogy was something that's very interesting i didn't think of it that way so it looks like uh, you know Uh, the learning of abc will stop at a i i i mean on a later vein kind of scenario you know so but uh, it's 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 highly important and good to know that uh, electric vehicles instead of uh, only consuming energy are in the regenerative mode and we saw that in the hybrid cars first you know the prius etc which came out earlier and now of course uh, we are all waiting for uh, mahindra's and uh, tata's and a couple of other companies to bring in a whole lot of uh, 
vehicles. And of course, the entire movement, uh, everybody is aware of what Tesla is also doing uh, across, not just in cars, but as, uh, uh, as a technology company too. So I think that, that you're in the right business at the right time uh, driving and the, the racing is just the front end of bringing in the highest level of efficiency, the maximum amount of uh, energy conversion possible uh, in terms of and the usage and so on. So coming to the, you know, you, you, your previous, the last but one slide had, uh, what are the opportunities for doing technology partnership? So let me just, and that is something that's going to be inter of interest to a lot of the startups who are participating in this conference today and who are listening to you. Uh, so in my, and I think you mentioned a little bit, one is definitely materials, which you just mentioned. So composites and materials is one area. Uh, second one is software, and you had software when you described the three parts that go into the race, hardware, software, and strategy. So hardware is pretty much same everywhere, software and strategy. So the software aspects are there. And within software, there are many areas. So I think I want you to, to highlight a few areas in terms of, for example, you mentioned edge computing. And the edge computing is even being taken further, right? So what are the opportunities for some of the fabulous design houses for some of the chip designers in India? I think you have something for them there, which you are looking to partner with. Tell us something about it. So when you talk about edge computing, okay, and again, I have to put the disclaimer, I'm not the technical guy, so I might use some terms in, incorrectly out here. So we also look at, okay, there is uh, the data transfer from the car back to the uh, station where we are all working at. It takes time. Okay, we, then we process it and then the data goes back. We're losing time. So what the holy grail which we are trying to chase is to do computing on the car itself. So basically make ourselves redundant. Okay, so information comes off the car. It's processed on the car. It gives the information to the driver on the car and so we go on. So we basically save that amount of time. We have done a little bit of work towards that with one of our uh, partners from Japan who has developed some specific semiconductors for us. But I think that's an area which we feel is going to be a business case going forward is if more information can be processed on the vehicle itself, because it can give a lot of an advantage, not only in racing, but also for road going vehicles. So this is highly efficient, uh, um, low power, very fast computing, uh, system on a chip design kind of stuff that you're looking, that you're, look, you're asking for, you're ask, you're asked for one, not one second, but probably several hundred, several hundredths of a second, you know, maybe tenth of a second or a one hundredth of a second. So this is something that's going to be useful if it is innovated in the in the in the car. It can be used in, for example, healthcare. You know, we talk of the golden hour. We may be talking about a golden second uh, sometime in future. You know, when you can actually anticipate a stroke and prevent a stroke. I mean, I'm just extrapolating. Okay, so there could be some uh, some very good insights that companies might be interested in. So those guys who are listening and who want to collaborate with Dilbak, please look him up uh, and write to him at his, uh, at his uh, email address that he was flashed. I'll ask him to show it again at the end. Okay. Uh, what about uh, QA and testing? You know, I, I, how much QA do you do of all your software and testing? Do you outsource it? And the related question, which I'll come to is, what kind of partners do you have? you know, in, in your ecosystem? I really don't know much about a QA and testing because we have, I see what we do is like, we have very much, being a smaller team, it's largely individual contributors who are very good at what they do. Okay. And being in the sport industry, Anand, and then when we worked together like 10, 15 years ago, de developing software for the FIFA World Cup in 2010, I think what we basically learned is do it right the first time around. And in sport, that's the main important, okay? The, the, the green lights are going to go off at four o'clock in the evening. You are ready or not, sports starts on time. Okay, so I think that's something which is really important and which was a learning it from the, my Satyam days 15 years ago was that we have to start learning how to do it right the first time around and right from the basic principles. So we spend a lot of time in our planning, a lot of time in, in sort of design and then sort of go and do coding. So our bits, what we do are not very large compared to traditional uh, bits of software. So it's very specific and I think it's individuals who sort of work on it at the spot and uh, yes, there are bugs. We do have to solve stuff because we are in an environment which is constantly changing. Like for example, the grip of a track changes. If it rains uh, that morning, 
a lot of assimilation has been thrown out of the window because we have to redo everything with the rain now. Okay, it's coming. Or uh, there's a dust storm or something like that. So there are like, bits we have to be adaptive to. But at the same time, I think uh, it's the rigor in the programming itself. So it's basically the individual who does it uh, right from programming to QA, it's up to them to bring up the quality. Great. Yeah. So while we are chatting, uh, you may want to open up your chat and check whether there are any questions there as we go ahead. And I would encourage uh, folks to ask questions. So let me just see. I think a few are coming through. I'll, I'll come to them in a, in a, in a little while. And uh, I would encourage uh, a lot of the audience to please post questions and we will be able to take them up uh, very shortly. I go to the next uh, section, uh, Dilbag, uh, why, of, of my, and this is something that you mentioned, but a lot of the people might have missed it when you mentioned the portfolio of electric vehicles and the portfolio of automotive that uh, Mahindra has invested in. And uh, I know I looked it up and we have talked about it earlier too. So I want you to talk about a little bit about uh, the company Pininfarina. Okay, Pininfarina is an Italian styling and design, designer of initially cars, but transportation vehicles based in uh, Turin, I think in Italy. And uh, with Dilbag obviously, because it's a Mahindra company now visits them and um, my question is, these are styling and design, and I've gone to the website and seen their designs. I mean, they design some of the fancy uh, yachts or ra racing boats. They design private jets and so on. So my question to you is not what they do in terms of what appears excellently. How do designers, when you interact with them, how do you think the designers incorporate technology? Of course, tell us a little bit about Pininfarina also, because I think that will be interesting to people. But how do the designers look at technology, you know? And is technology at the back of the mind when gadgets, when people, when, when uh, uh, transportation vehicles are being designed today? And how is it being incorporated in some of the best in class? Because these guys are best in class. Okay. Well, uh, Anand, that's a very, very interesting question. And I think when we acquired Pin and Farina three years ago, it was basically it was known as a design studio. It's a 90 year old design studio. It has designed every Ferrari car till a couple of years ago. So all the Ferraris, which you see growing up, et cetera, were designed by Pin and Farina and a lot more stuff which has been done by them. But at the same time, I think they try and understand human dynamics. How do humans interact with the world? I think that's where we have a lot of people we have look, sort of going on to look at anthropology, et cetera, in terms of how do we interact with stuff? And then we start working towards design out there, intelligent design. Okay, so at the same time, I think the philosophy of design out here is that it should be classically beautiful for years to come. As we, as we call it, it should be an object of desire. So when you look at uh, we at Pin and Farina, the design ethos is to look at design, which 40 years from now will still look beautiful. So when you go back to the like the Italian classics, why do we love Italy? We go back to the Renaissance. Okay, it's like we're talking about stuff which is designed hundreds of years ago, and they're still beautiful for us in the context. The life of the product has to outlook the individual who has designed it, and I think that's the philosophy of there. So when we do cars, also. Uh, uh, when you're doing cars, we look at uh, evolution in terms of how technology gets there because we need to make the cars more relevant. We need to make the cars more useful for the people. But at the same time, it's something when you step back after a drive and you look back and you say, wow, I really enjoyed it. Because see, when you're sitting in a car, you don't see the outside. But when you step back out, you, if you want to look at it as a piece of art. So it's basically uh, the art outside and the part inside, which is really important. And that's where Mahindra Racing and Pin and Freena work very closely to, with each other to develop products. We, they are the art, we are the part. Okay, we put stuff together. And in fact, we have launched a brand called Automobili Pin and Farina, which is starting to uh, bring out some hypercars in the uh, thing, what we call through the sustainable luxury line. So next March, which is just three months from now, the first delivery of our cars will be a uh, thing. And just to give you context in the, the technology you're talking about in these cars, you saw the picture of the car earlier. I think it's one of the most beautiful cars, the Batista. It goes from zero to 100 in less than two seconds. So already 100 kilometers per hour. It's 1,900 horsepower. When I started driving many years ago with the Maruti 800, 
that was the thing was 41 horsepower so 40 to 1900 it's a huge difference yeah. or there yeah but i think at the same time we are going to be bringing out further products in that range mahindra from an electric perspective does bicycles to hypercars so we have electric bicycles in the united states scooters cars uh, auto rickshaws uh, now we're going to be coming out with a new uh, motorcycle brand in the united kingdom and then so there's a, a pretty large portfolio here great so i think uh, uh, take take a look at your uh, screen i think the point that you made out is apart from the beauty the human machine interface hmi and uh, the user experience is something that is uh, really going into the design of all these cars and that's going to benefit each one of us as we go forward so great so i think um, uh, we will probably be able to take a, a few audience questions uh, if you need any help open your chat box please uh, go through the audience questions uh, thank you audience for your patience and uh, uh, dilbak uh, go ahead and choose what question you would like to answer well let me start with a question from ravi guru raj when my f1 flip to ev well f1 already today uses 30% of their energy comes from electric so they have batteries they have the kurs system the kinetic energy recovery system i uh, think so around 200 horsepower 250 horsepower of around 900 horsepower is actually coming from electric mobility so it's been there for the last couple of years as you know f1 is a hybrid racing platform right now they've already moved to hybrid engines in the last 6 years so yeah uh that part of the world has already moved to to a bit to the electric side so we see some convergence happening so i uh, the next question is from navin hari which i'll sort of take up uh we would love to we are looking forward to bringing formula e a race to india we have done some scouting for a few locations um uh, and i think in the next year or two we should potentially have a race in india the difference between formula e compared to formula 1 for people who have not followed our sport is that we race on city streets we don't go to a circuit so we don't go away from the city because our cars are quieter we race within the city so when we race in paris it's downtown paris or downtown london or downtown rome so we have to look for an appropriate downtown location either maybe mumbai or hyderabad bangalore or delhi so depending on which parts of it and i think our philosophy is that you don't have to go for a race we bring the race to you and i think that's been pretty successful so people in various cities you see when you go for a race they open the balconies and they're watching it etc it's quite interesting because we are in their neighborhood maybe i'll take another question uh from no i i don't read very fast i'm getting old my eyes are not thing uh i think there is from uh, maybe from devik do you think new business models arrived due to iit in the e mobility space i think absolutely because i think e mobility is largely to do with software and as you've seen like with tesla or other examples and you no know, as you move towards autonomous driving etc you are going to be seeing a lot more opportunities in e mobility for software houses because i think e mobility to a large extent has democratized automotive industry it has disrupted the automotive industry today to set up an e uh, like a car a company which is making evs is much more easier because there's a few components only had put together to make a car uh it's the engine only has one moving component which is your motor it's no more like 300 or more uh, like uh, moving components etc so it's easy to buy assemble the stuff and put it in and there after take the software to take it forward so i think that's so now let's just try and go to naman bhardwaj is this the good idea to replace petrol vehicle electric vehicle by improving speed and backup for pollution free see the end of the day we believe evs and sustainability is a philosophy sustainability is not just a tick box it's a philosophy it's how you look at life ev is are just a part of looking at life and the way we define sustainability at mahindra racing is that today's solutions should not become tomorrow's problems so we have to look at a very far horizon of there and when we look at evs we basically feel okay we talk about pollution and most of us especially growing up in india we talk about pollution from in the sense of the smoke etc one thing which we forget is the second form of pollution which evs tackle is called noise pollution because when you have a old diesel bus going around like cranking gears or there crunching gears etc making the sound it does dis- disrupt our life when you hear those cars if you hear silent vehicles going around just imagine your quality of life first of all the air is better but also there's less sound okay 
it makes life a lot more peaceful. You'll, in the city, you'll be able to hear the birds. You'll be able to hear all sounds which you have never heard before. And I think that makes a huge difference with pollution. We're tackling it from two sides, noise and air quality. I don't know how we are on time, Anand. Do we, uh, should we take any? We have another five minutes, uh, Dilbert. So I need uh, two, three minutes to wrap up in the end. Uh, so we can take another five minutes easily of more questions. I think there are questions coming up. Um, I think let's take, Indu's, Indu, let's take Indu Radhakrishnan's question, because I think that's something is a problem for us. We have 120 sensors. We collect data. We are today not able to process all the data. Of, let me say, like, the amount of data which we want to process, we cannot. We don't have the capability and the ability. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm on this forum asking for help. We are still following the 80-20 rule. We're basically, we're getting 80% output from 20% of the sensors, and that's what we're focusing on. So while we collect the data from these 120 sensors, a lot of it's post-processed after a race in terms of information. If we can start processing it during an event, I think it'll make us a lot more stronger. So Indu, please reach out with some thoughts and suggestions what you have. And I'd love to hear it from maybe the 40 to 50 main sensors which you're working on. Can I take it to 60? Because there's no more silver bullets left in our racing. We're looking at every incremental bit. And even like, for example, the brake temperature. Okay, uh, can I sort of, uh, use it a bit better because then uh, when I do brake by wire in the car, the braking modulation is a lot more because the moment we use a little bit more brakes in the car during a race, I'm wasting energy. Braking is waste of energy. So we have to be very specific in terms of how we are going to be using it. Okay, good. Um, we can take a few more questions. We can run through this. Uh, the, do you want me to read the next question? Sure, um, Anand. When you speak about formula racing, how is it possible in e-mobility to increase torque and speed? Asked by Hitesh. Okay, Hitesh, hi. So but the interesting thing about e-mobility is that we get 100% torque at zero RPM. So and I think that makes electric cars a lot more exciting, okay? Because in a petrol car, you have to build up the revs to get a higher amount of torque. For us, yeah. torque starts at the top and it sort of remains flat. So that's why if you start an e-car and you step on your throttle, you could have either a big smile on your face because it's going to give you a bit of joy that you had a launch or you're in big trouble, my friend. You've, you've, the car has reached somewhere where you didn't want it to reach. So uh, we are really like talking a lot about in torque. And like for us, like in e-mobility, we, uh, we constantly keep measuring the torque and we keep varying the torque depending on the road grip. So we are actually checking the grip of the road and then deploying torque because the moment we have more torque than what the grip can take, we are starting to slip the tires. And for us, like end of the day, it's the four tires which are touching the ground. So whatever we do in design, it's those four tires which propel us forward. So we have to check the health of those tires. And uh, Hitesh, when we talk about speed, increase of speed in electric mobility is much faster because we get the instant torque. So uh, like and torque and then these cars have a reasonable amount of horsepower. So horsepower gives you speed, torque gives you the energy to sort of move it forward. And when we talk about other cars, which we are racing in, in Formula E, we go from zero to 100 in around 2.4 seconds. And uh, that's what we're talking about. And our top speeds around 280 kilometers per hour. And these 280 kilometers, which may not sound too much compared to 350 in Formula One, we are able to reach 280 kilometers per hour in less than 600 meters. So between our longest straight is 600 meters from a corner to the next straight. So within this thing, we are able to reach 280. And imagine these are city circuits. So while you're in the downtown Paris, driving at 280 kilometers per hour, my friend, gives you a lot of excitement end of the day. Yes, uh, that was, that, that's an exciting uh, thing. The next question is on, uh, in an area where the, the person, uh, Arnav Gulati is asking, are you looking to partner with virtual reality and augmented reality solutions, uh, Indian companies? So I hold this answer to the question because I'm going to make an offer to you. There are so many startups uh, working with, I, with the IoT Forum. We have a directory with over 2,000 companies and many of those companies are uh, doing quite leading edge work. Several of them are part of what we call paid IoT Forum members. So once you become a paid member, you become part of a closed community wherein you can collaborate, we can innovate, you can look for talent, 
You can pose a question, technology challenge, and get somebody to answer it, etc. So Dilbag, as a CEO of a startup, Mahindra Racing, I would invite you to join the IoT Forum group. I'll, 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 uh, we'll work on the process later and talk about it. So now the question on, are you will hold, looking to partner AR, VR companies? First of all, Anand, thank you for the invitation, which we'll gladly accept. And we look forward to being a constructive member of the IIT Forum. I do uh, visit Bangalore uh, quite frequently on my responsibilities as Mahindra Electric. So at some point in time when the virtual world becomes a real world again, I would love to meet the other members physically of the IoT Forum. But going back to uh, the question which we had out here is, yes, a VR and AR is really important because it helps in the training of a thing. And we would love to partner with organizations who have certain amount of technology coming out here because we want to... We have certain idea in terms of what we call is trying to distribute some of our, our responsibilities. And I think with AR and VR, we would be able to distribute some of the work which you're doing across multiple mode nodes in terms of e-gaming towards real racing. And that's, we see the amalgamation of e-racing and real racing coming closer to each other to help propel one another. Great. So um, audience, um, I've got a time signal that we have two minutes to wrap up. So. Uh, I will start my uh, duties as host of this session. So first of all, uh, thank you audience. Uh, I'm sure you are, are excited uh, and uh, uh, I'm happy to listen to uh, this uh, innovative uh, uh, expose of e-formula racing and the connect to the real world. Uh, so thank you audience and do stay on for all of us. I'm, the two day conference is going to be very exciting for you. Uh, next, I would definitely like to thank Dilbert, but before I do that, I want to be able to leave uh, him and leave you audience with a little bit of a personal touch and a note. A lot of you might not know, and especially for a lot of us, the IoT Forum headquartered in Bangalore, uh, people do not know, but uh, Dilbert is a mechanical engineer, alumnus from our own Bengaluru's RV College of Engineering. Okay, so I think we are all very proud. RV is an is a is a is an excellent college, and so thank you, Dilbag, for uh, for that piece of uh, information. Um, Dilbag has continued his relationship with uh, uh, with RV College. He has mentored the RV College racing team to the finalists in the World Student Car Championships. Not once, many times, you know, in multiple years. So he does mentor the college students, and uh, today. Uh, he every every year one student from RV College interns at the Mahindra Racing facility in UK, and he personally oversees that, and therefore is connected to the academic institutions. Also continues. Uh, on a personal note, we, we all know how passionate he is, and I just want to mention that during his college and student days, he was a rally driver in both racing. Mechanic, uh, both racing motorcycles as well as cars. And he used to tell me during, you know, whenever we chat up, that he used to beg and borrow and build a supercar. Being a student, obviously, you cannot really fund yourself, right? So, but still, the passion for racing is there, and you can see how passionate he is. And he's really lucky to make a career out of his passion. So, thank you, Dilbag, uh, for an outstanding uh, keynote uh, with us today. I'm sure I enjoyed it, and all of our audience enjoyed it. And on behalf of the IoT Forum and Thai Bangalore, uh, we sincerely thank you for making the time and uh, enlightening this in this exciting world. So over to the, uh, to the conference host. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, and look, wish you all success for the next two days. I'm sure you're going to learn a lot uh, because I've set the bar pretty low. And look, enjoy it. Take care, everyone. Stay well. Stay safe.